We thought you might like to know about baseball great Carl Erskine. He's from Anderson, Indiana, and filmmaker Ted Green just made a great new movie about him. It is called The Best We've Got, The Carl Erskine Story. Erskine was at the forefront of two civil rights movements. First, he was one of the best friends of Jackie Robinson. He played on the Boys of Summer team with Jackie Robinson as he broke barriers with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And he also had a son with Down syndrome and was very important in the beginning of the Special Olympics. Ted Green joins me to talk about his story as well as the Erskine Personal Impact Curriculum, which is available in your school. Learn more here on The Chris Spangle Show. Ted Green, thanks so much for joining me here on the podcast. I appreciate you coming on and talking with our audience. Oh, my my great pleasure. I really appreciate the platform. So if you don't know Ted Green, he is a director, producer, writer, and he I love your tagline on your website, Ted Green Film, TedGreenFilms.com. Storytelling that celebrates the triumph of the human spirit. I just think that's tremendous. Tell me a little bit about your career, why the tagline, and how did you get into the work? And what's your motivating mission? I was a career newspaper journalist. I was in sports departments. I did some writing, but mostly as an editor. And then and I did that for 20 years. And then it was really, it's almost like a little midlife crisis thing that, that led me into films. Honestly, what it was 2009 and John Wooden had just turned 99 years old. And I was in charge of a digital sports operation at the Indianapolis Star at the time. And I thought, he's a Hoosier. And I thought, we need to do something special. We need to prepare something special for the day he turns 100 or in the sad event, he doesn't make it either way. And you know what normally that was, at least back at the time for newspapers, was you write a super long story. It might, have, it might jump twice and it might have four or five big photos. And maybe you throw a photo gallery online, but that was pretty much it. And I thought, man, if anybody deserves something a little more than that is Coach Wooden. And so I thought, how hard could it be to try a little five minute video? I'd string together some, some maudlin music and I'd record a little narration, which I did back in the boiler room and I'll do a couple of interviews and it'll work somehow. Well, I got into it so much, this new form of storytelling and what it could do and what on camera interviews you could do. What I like to say is sometimes you see, you hear more from the look in the eyes than you actually do from what's coming out in the mouth. And so I, anyways, the five minute video turned out to be a 35 minute video and the people at the star understandably were pissed. They were like, what are we doing? We don't do 30 minute videos, especially without a sponsor. I hadn't even considered that. I came to consider that quite a bit, but. And then that's all I was considered. (laughs) Yeah. So I was in trouble there for a second, but then somebody suggested I cold call it up the street to WFYI, the public television affiliate here in Indianapolis. And we had to redo, they really liked the story. We had to redo a lot of it, a lot of the narration and there was stuff I was, it's so, even looking back on it now, it's so rudimentary. It almost embarrasses me because I'm so far, but because it was coach, it was very popular. It played across the country. And what I did is I looked at his Indiana roots as opposed to what happened after that. I stopped the story when he got to UCLA because everybody knows what he did at UCLA, but he did a lot of fascinating stuff, including racially right here in Indiana before he moved out there. So that was my focus. Anyway, based on that, and then we found a sponsor. So then also I was a little more popular with the bosses again. We decided to do one more video on Hoosier military veterans. I worked with my colleague Don on that one. And then on the, those are both 30 minute docs. And I just fell in love with it. I thought this is my calling. It's weird sometimes to find your calling after 20 some years in another field, but I did. So I took that jump. And since then I've done several more films. A lot of the early ones were about sports because that's what I knew. And frankly, because sports sells, if you're trying to find sponsors, but I found myself in those documentaries, like about Roger Brown, the very first Indiana Pacer, and then Slick Leonard, of course, his coach. I found myself so much more interested in what happened off the court or off the field. And and again, and I evolved into, yes, about that tagline, I evolved into that, to the triumph of the human spirit. And then I thought, well, you know what? It's time to branch out outside sports. And I'm sorry, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut this short. No, we don't have a time limit here. On but after, uh, after those two that I just mentioned, I wanted to do something on Crispus Attucks High School here in Indianapolis, not just the basketball team, which a million things have been done about the basketball team, including some by me, but I wanted to look at the whole school. And And let me interrupt. And just so if you're outside of the Indiana area for our national audience, Crispus Attucks is the, it was the segregated black school here in Indianapolis. And 
Correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't Indiana largely unsegregated and then it got segregated? Yeah, we were. And, and was, it was crazy what happened here. It was different than in most other northern cities. The southern, the migration of African Americans up from the south before, during, and after World War. It, it we just it, the population, the African American population in Indianapolis was uh, by percentage was bigger than that of almost all other major northern cities. And on, on the strength of that, or not on the strength of that, but that's the reason why Indianapolis, there were three high schools during the 1920s here in Indianapolis, and they were all integrated. But then when more and more African Americans moved up, the city leaders, and basically it was everybody, some people say it was just the Ku Klux Klan, which was in power to some degree then, but that's not true. It was everybody. They decided we needed to take all the black students they were becoming too many in the white high schools. We need to make, build them their own high school in their part of town, essentially, so we don't have to see them or hear them or anything like that. It sounds completely ugly, but that is exactly what happened. That's the high school that went on to great fame with basketball player Oscar Robertson. It became the first all-black school anywhere in the country to win an open state basketball championship. But again, I wanted to look Beyond that, I wanted to look at the ways the school actually, this was basically created to fail, had the opposite effect. And to some degree, it helped open up the city racially. And I think that is its greatest legacy. And so I did that. And then I followed that with way beyond the world of sports with Eva Kaur, a Holocaust survivor who was settled in Terre Haute, Indiana. And she became famous because infamous in some, in some among some people because she ended up forgiving the Nazis. She went to Auschwitz. She survived experiments, died by Dr. Joseph Mengele. She was then, a twin. What's that? She was one of the Mengele twins. She was right. one of the Mengele twins. And so she went through untold horrors and her family was killed. And yet 50 years after liberation to the day, she forgave the Nazis and became a pariah among some and a hero among others. And I was fortunate enough to be able to know her and go to Auschwitz with her and Romania with her and Israel with her. And I got to chronicle her life. And I'll tell you what, all this buildup, you talk about the celebrating the triumph of the human spirit. I wasn't sure where it was going to go after the Crispus Attic story and then Eva Kaur. But then based on a tip from Slick Leonard, the longtime Indiana Pacers coach that he had given me years earlier, I decided to look a little bit into Carl Erskine. And what I found blew me away far beyond what he did on the baseball field. And I was just, uh, I just had this gut feeling that this is a story I needed to tell. And I will say that I now looking back, I believe this story was something, the message of this story is something I've been subconsciously working toward my whole career. And it took Carl Erskine and his beautiful wife, Betty, to take me that last step. I just want to give Dacian on Ava Kaur, your documentary. The Indiana Historical Society has an amazing exhibit. If you're in Indiana, it's all, it's if you're drivable, it's worth it because you can sit and talk to Ava Kaur is amazing she's got a tremendous story i have not in full disclosure seen the carl erskine documentary but oh. i've seen a lot of the trailers um i'm going to be honest with you at 39 years old i had never heard of carl erskine <laughs> but i was wildly impressed with the man and so he was a baseball player who was at the forefront of two civil rights movements which we'll talk about why don't we just start with who is carl erskine and tell us a little bit about the man and then we'll talk about the politics of it because okay. what because what the way that you do the story and the way that you talk about it, the way he talks about it it doesn't everybody's saturated oh politics and sports need to be separated but he seemed to do it gracefully and in an inspiring way. And I think that's what impressed me a lot in kind of our environment today. Yeah, he is definitely a guy worth knowing about. I barely knew who he was myself. I did because my background is in sports and I'm a sports history guy. And so I knew about the boys of summer, those Brooklyn Dodgers teams that he was on. They were called that by, uh, oh my gosh, what's his name? The fabulous book by that same name, Roger Kahn wrote it. But anyways, so Carl Erskine, what most people know him as, is as a baseball player. And he was a great one. He, during a 12-year career from 1948 to 1959, he played for the Brooklyn Dodgers and then the LA Dodgers at the very end. During this time frame, he threw two no-hitters. He set a World Series strikeout record. 14 against the Yankees, including four against Mickey Mantle. He won a World Series and he appeared in five. And he was a star on the grandest stage, New York City, 
of what was then by far the biggest sport going. And this was also during the most, the most I would say the most transformative area era of baseball. He was there for as it went from trains to planes. It went from radio to TV. It went from East Coast to West, including his Dodgers. And biggest of all, of course, it went from segregated to integrated with his very close friend, Jackie Robinson and Carl Erskine, this guy that the most humble guy you've ever met. He's now 96. He's the last of the boys of summer. He's from tiny Anderson, Indiana. He lived there his entire life. This guy was front and center for all of it. And he's just this, and he can, and he loves writing about it, telling you about it. He's just like this link into this past time. And, and for that reason alone, you have lots of people. I know lots of grown men, very successful guys who make pilgrimages up to Anderson every year just to sit at his, in his modest home at his kitchen table and to listen to this guy tell stories. But really, and you alluded to this earlier, if that's what all Carl Erskine really was, I wouldn't have done this film. There are a lot of players. He's not in the Hall of Fame and probably doesn't deserve to be, but he was just a very good player. But again, as you mentioned, it was, he did, he was such a big part of these two huge social revolutions. First, racially, his best friend growing up and all the way through life was jumping Johnny Wilson, an African-American kid in his neighborhood. They met in the early 1930s, not even 10 years after the Ku Klux Klan ran Indiana. And believe me, racism was still absolutely rampant. And yet, so Carl would swim at the only black swim pool in town because that's the only place his buddy Johnny Wilson could swim. Carl would only go to restaurants that Johnny could go to. Carl would sit with Johnny on the balcony at the theater because that's the only place blacks could be. Now, Johnny Wilson went on to great fame. He was the Mr. Basketball of Indiana in 46, won a state championship that year. But then, and so this is a time when every force in society was essentially pushing Carl away from Johnny. And yet Carl did the opposite. Carl embraced him. And in that, as he later said, when he looked back in his life with retrospect, really prepared him for Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson, of course, became the first African-American Major League Baseball player in 1947 with the Dodgers. Carl was signed by the same guy, Branch Rickey, the following year. And Carl and Jackie just hit it off. And I go into this a lot in the film. Sometimes the picture of that Dodger togetherness often is Pee Wee Reese throwing his arm around Jackie Robinson. There's even a statue of it. And he did that, most people think. That was a very courageous move for him to do. But Carl understood it more. Carl had a lot more empathy just because of everything he'd gone through with Johnny. And so Carl and Rachel Robinson says this, a lot of people say it that their bond was pr probably the strongest that Jackie had with any of his teammates, and it stuck with them. In fact, the year that Jackie Robinson died, 1972, shortly before that, he said that no other Dodger, none, knew more, understood more about what was going on racially than Carl Erskine did. And that is saying quite a bit. So Carl had that part of it. He was front and center again. Well, and when they would go on the road, too, it was no small thing for Jackie Robinson to travel with the teams. And oh, no. It was Carl it, was a huge ally to him when they would go to hotels that wouldn't let Jackie stay. It was terrible. And I will say, Carl, I would say to his credit, looks back now and he thinks, boy, I probably could have done more than I did. But he did the most, I would say, at the time. And that's something that obviously it stuck with Jackie for the rest of his life. And yeah, the, the racism Jackie Robinson faced, the hatred, the bigotry, that's been really well chronicled. But, but what think... did Carl Erskine go through, like being an ally? Because I know that in the civil rights era, it would it, obviously James, is it James Reeb from the White Lies podcast that the evangelical pastor that goes down and ends up getting killed just being part of the Edmund Pettus march? Obviously, what Jackie went through was a lot worse. So I'm not minimizing that in any way, but... To be an ally of Jackie Robinson in that time period, what did that cost Carl Erskine anything? I think Carl would say quite the opposite. I think Carl would say he gained tremendously from that whole experience. He says he's never seen anybody as courageous as Jackie. He got to witness his friend stand up and triumph, triumph over this horrible racial hatred. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. even said that if it wouldn't have been for Jackie Robinson, 
I never would have been able to do what I was able to do. Jackie kicked the door open. Carl was right there with Jackie in that locker room on that field all summer long. And they would go to schools together and give speeches. They'd make all these appearances together. Carl saw this and that I think improved Carl. Carl would say the same thing. He just, his eyes, he was prepared for it by Johnny Wilson, but it's one thing to swim at the all black pool when you're a white boy in, in Anderson, Indiana in the mid thirties. And another thing to be sitting there with Jackie Robinson when sort of the hatred of the, bigot, of the bigoted world is focused on this one guy. And he's a good friend and they continue to be good friends. Their wives were good friends. So that was, that was really something. And then of course, what that led to, what I think was the most, uh, I would say the most seminal moment of Carl's life, of Carl's wife, Betty's life, of all of the Erskine family. This would be the year after Carl retired, 1960, April 1st. They had their fourth child. His name was Jimmy. Jimmy had Down syndrome. The way they learned this was hearing nurses whisper, oh God, what's the word now? Hearing the nurses whisper, I think he's mongoloid. That was the super harsh term for that back at the time. In fact, they call them mongoloid idiots. Hard to believe, but it's true. At that time in 19, 1950s, 1960s, even up into the 1970s and beyond, what doctors recommended doing with people with intellectual disabilities like Down syndrome was to institutionalize them. Essentially lock them up in a facility that was supposed to care for them, but they really treated them for the most part horribly. Lock them up say goodbye and move on with the rest of their lives so as not to disrupt the family. It's kind of hard to imagine that now, considering how far we've come, but this was indeed the norm there. This is April 1st, 1960. So one of the things that I really spent some time on in the film is looking at how it got to that point. How did the treatment and the acceptance of people with intellectual disabilities sink to such a low point and then how did it come back? How did it get better? And what I found is Carl Erskine played an enormous role. You can call it a behind the scenes role. I would call it a very much hands-on role. He and Betty, they decided, you know what? We're taking Jimmy home with us and we're gonna raise him at home. Now, some people were doing that. They were part of what's called the parents movement of the 1950s and 60s that helped, that helped change that whole paradigm of acceptance and do away with these institutions. But, it, but at first it was hard. There was no schooling. There was no services. They didn't have special education classes. Raising a child at home, the four children, it was difficult for both of them. But they didn't just keep them at home. Some people did that. If they couldn't afford an institution, they would, they would keep their child at home. But they would leave them at home. They didn't want to take him out. Carl and Betty did the opposite. They took their Jimmy with them everywhere they went, whether it was to church, whether it was to a restaurant, to parties, anything. And gradually over time changed and opened a lot of hearts and minds. It started in Anderson. And then as Carl got involved in 1970 in Special Olympics, then he started going all around Indiana. And in fact, Eunice Kennedy Shriver was so enamored of Carl as a terrific spokesman, because not only a former athlete, but also a hands-on father, she started flying him all around the country where Carl would do what became sort of his shtick, if I may. It, and Shriver it, started the Special Olympics. Yeah, right? I know. I, I, it's right. one of the things you get all these things in your head. You don't know. I mean, the radio guy's here to just tease that out to make sure I get that. No, no, because like in a film, there's a bunch of setup that shows right. that. Yeah. So I do assume probably too much knowledge here. But yes, yeah, so Eunice Kennedy Shriver started the Special Olympics. The first one was in 1968. She started it because she had a sister who had an intellectual disability, Rosemary, who ended up being lobotomized in a failed experiment or a failed surgery, I should say, at the behest of her father. And this angered Eunice and just it energized her. And she already had a ton of energy, but she started really this huge movement that ended up being Special Olympics in 1968. So Carl got involved in 1970 when Jimmy was 10 years old. And early on, I think it would have been about 1972, Eunice invited a bunch of celebrities who had some tie into intellectual disability to the Kennedy Center in Washington for a first big gala fundraiser. And Carl did something there 
It just blew the room away. He wore his 1955 Brooklyn Dodgers World Series ring. He does that for special occasions. And he held it up and he said, I want to say how much this ring meant to me and my teammates. We worked so hard. We lost to the Yankees year after year and we finally overcame and we finally won. And this is the highest achievement you can have in our sport. And then he said, but let me show you something else. And he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out one of Jimmy's Special Olympics gold medals. And he said, I want to ask the audience, which of these represents the more impressive achievement? And at first there were tears and then there was applause and then <laughs> wallets started opening up and uh, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, no dummy, she said, Carl, you're coming on the road with me. And so she, again, she'd fly him around. And so he became really one of the biggest early spokespeople for Special Olympics, for the cause of people with intellectual disability. But you really... And I'm going in a bunch of different directions here, but no, this is great. Yeah. But the thing is, what you have to realize is the dissent, the treatment, the evolution of the treatment and acceptance of people with intellectual disabilities is, it was just so fascinating. I, I, if I may, we're little over a hundred years out here in Indiana from putting people like Jimmy to death with the eugenics yeah. movement. So does, and Carl has lived that lifespan. Does my question was, we take it for granted. Like we just look at the actions of Carl Erskine and go, this is just how you're supposed to act. But I think it's hard for someone my age, an older millennial to think of a time where this would be considered, where doing the right thing would be considered courageous. What does Carl think about that evolution that I think you're about to speak on? Carl, it's not like he studied it. He, I think Carl just knew that when he came along, that things were terribly wrong. And I've got to give equal credit, if not even more, to his wife, Betty, because Carl was the first, first one to say when Jimmy was born, he was bewildered. This possibility hadn't occurred to him. They had no issues with either of their, any of the first three children they had. It was Betty who made, put her foot down right away and said, no, I've carried this kid for nine months. He's coming home with us. But I still, I, as a history guy, and I try to, in these documentaries, I try to put things in context, tell a little story, but in context with the whole country and what was going on then. And it was just, I was utterly fascinated. And this is the part I believe, from what I've heard, fascinates the most people about the film is in the 1800s, and I'll go briefly through this, although it's a little bit hard to, the United States was an agrarian economy. Uh, it wasn't uncommon to see people with intellectual disability on the farm. They would help out however they could. Maybe they couldn't bail the most hay, but so they would be in charge of taking care of grandma or something like that. But it just wasn't uncommon. You see that. But when the Industrial Revolution came in at the end of the 1800s and in the early part of the 1900s, that changed everything. People moved into cities, factories sprung up, competition became king. And the, the idea being that those people who couldn't keep up, there was, they, it wasn't just, okay, it's fine, they just can't keep up. No, they were seen as problematic. They were like glitches in this, as I call it, an engine of progress. And so that's when they started creating these separate facilities for them and confining them to these places. And like, essentially, they weren't trying to cure them. They were just trying to separate them from society, much in the same way that Indianapolis was trying to separate the African-Americans from the general white population. But then, and then eugenics came up right near the same time, and that made things even worse. These eugenicists argue that it wasn't enough just to lock these people away and keep them away from the general population. These people inevitably, they said, were going to spread and procreate and, and the diseased animal that destroys the herd. This is kind of language that you would actually see in the eugenical writings. And this became very popular. Teddy Roosevelt backed this. The Supreme Court backed it in an infamous case. It was, it was, Eugenics was the thing. They had better babies contests at state fairs. They were certainly here in Indianapolis, better babies contests. You think there are any black kids in those better baby contests? No, I wouldn't say so. Or in people with any sort of intellectual or physical disability. But that was the idea. If you need to grow the perfect person. And so this was, it was terrible. And Indiana has the very, I would say, poor distinction of being the first state in the nation to pass what is called a compulsory sterilization law. And that is as grisly as it sounds. It's the idea is in order to prevent this spreading of this horrible, as they called it, disease, they would sterilize people so that they couldn't 
have kids. It's as, it's as simple as that. Now, if that sounds a little bit what was going on to some degree, the Nazis and World With War II, I was about to say, yeah. I mean, it directly George Bernard Shaw and the entire movement kind of plays into some of what Mangala was. Not only on. that, and this is a, something that we discovered for the film, that in, the, in their defense at the Nuremberg trials, the Nazis cited Indiana's law. I've got it there. You got it in German, but you can clearly read Indiana in 1907. They were saying, look, the United States did the same stuff. It started in Indiana in 1907. Of course, this is Carl State, but it didn't end in Indiana. At the end, more than 30 states had compulsory sterilization laws, some of which stayed on the books into the 60s or even beyond. This was this what was going on. Now, because of the Nazis, all of a sudden compulsory sterilization started falling out of favor in the United States a little bit right around then, the 1940s and 1950s. But still, the idea was that didn't stop the idea of separating them. These institutions multiplied and they didn't staff them well, anything like that. So essentially, there were these huge just warehouses. Geraldo Rivera did something, and I've got it in the film. And this was in 1972, I think. He went to an institution in New York and it was and brought a camera in and did the whole thing. And it was just absolutely appalling. This has been going on for 80, 90 years or 80 years or so in this country at that point. 70. Sorry, my math's a little bit off. A long hell, a hell of a long time. And so this is this was the world in 1960 when Carl and Betty had their child Jimmy. It was Basically, you're supposed to be embarrassed by this kid. You're supposed, for the good of your family, you're supposed to put him away. You're supposed to move on with your life. And this movement, the parents' movement, they changed this whole thing. It wasn't then about eugenic fears. It wasn't about cost analysis, what's best for the economy. It's about treating people with dignity and love and respect. And Carl and Betty were the leaders of this. They really were because they were living it every single day. Here's a guy of great stature and he's out there with everywhere he goes with his kid. Did he worry if it made people uncomfortable? Hell no. If Jimmy acted up in places, did they have to sometimes sit him down, but they'd bring him right back in. And over time, again, change their neighborhood first. The president of Special Olympics, Jeff Moeller, who couldn't be with us today, he says this in the film. First, they changed their neighborhood. Then they changed their city. Then they changed their state. And they weren't done there. And you hear this from so many people in so many ways that Indiana, I'll, I'll, here's a headline for you. Indiana has gone from arguably being the worst state in the union in far as the treatment and the, the treatment of acceptance of people with intellectual disability to now, by many measures, being right up there with the best. Incredible participation in Special Olympics. In fact, the most high schools involved in unified sports um, of any state in the country. The ARC chapter here is, I think, the second biggest in the country. There's the Erskine Green Rehab Center or treatment. Erskine Green Treatment Institute, Erskine, forgetting this, the Erskine I'll, I'll Green Google it real quick. Institute up in Muncie. Anyways, Indiana's gone from worst to near first, and everybody who has knowledge of this going all the way back say that while it took a village for that, it was Carl and Betty Erskine right at the top of the list. They are the ones who deserve most credit for making that sea change. And how do they do it? Not by shaming. Not by scolding, not by preaching, but showing every day, getting up, fighting that good fight every day. That's what they did. And they're still doing it. Carl's 96. Betty is 94. Jimmy, who was supposed to live until his mid 30s at best, that was the life expectancy back then. In a couple of weeks here, April 1st, he's going to turn 63 years old. And I think if there's any testament to the love and the strength, and the power and the impact of Carl and Betty Erskine, it is right there embodied in their son, Jimmy, who has had an exceptional life. So let's talk, and it is, I should acknowledge here in March, it's Trisomy Awareness Month. My wife and I actually are having a child and we had low fetal DNA. And so we were, unfortunately, a lot of people choose, 86% of people choose not to carry on with the pregnancy, but that was something we were prepared to do because of stories like his. It's a beautiful loving soul the child is deserves a chance he or she we don't know the sex yet but it's 
we should just acknowledge how amazing that story is and how many people now choose to carry on with that pregnancy and make sure that the world is blessed with a kid like this. Let me tell you, I wish Betty Erskine could be on this on this podcast with us. She would be so proud of you and your wife. That's something that she is a she's a very humble, soft-spoken person, but she is so loud about that. You need to let these children let them have the beautiful life that they're going to have. Be their biggest advocate. She's it has changed their lives tremendously. And I will I'll say this, after we, we've had a lot of screenings of the film, which has been terrific. Incredible premiere up in Anderson. And since then, I think we've had 40 screenings and we still have more coming up. Special Olympics is Indiana is doing just a terrific job handling most of those. But then afterward, you, sh you show the film afterward, there's usually some people who want to talk to me, you know, about it. They've got some connection to Carl or whatever. But what moves you the most, and this has happened several times, I'll have either a father or a mother with a child come up to me afterward in tears saying that I just, if it wasn't for Carl and Betty Erskine, I probably wouldn't have this beautiful child right now. And it is, I don't even know what to say to that. That's why I was just, I consider myself unbelievably blessed and fortunate that I am in a position to, to tell these stories, to share, to, to share this goodness, for lack of a better word, that Carl and Betty exemplify, they embody, that they are. And I think there was a, a book that came out several years ago, won the Pulitzer Prize. It's called The Overstory. In it, there's a line that says, the best argument in the world won't change a person's mind. The only thing that can do that is a good story. I firmly 100% believe that Carl and Betty and Jimmy Erskine's story is that story. It seems to be a story because of them, not the way I told it, that people want to get back to their roots and want to make good ethic decisions, want to live a lifestyle that's uncomplicated, that's more about love than it isn't. And uh, I know those are huge words, but I just, I would hope if you haven't seen the film yet, anybody out there, there are many ways to see it now. If you just go to carlerskinfilm.com, carlerskinfilm.com, you can buy DVDs, you can buy Blu-rays, you can sign up for screenings. We have a streaming option now for as little as $14. You can go on and you can, you can watch the full film. And this is all right there at the top of that website, but you gotta see Carl's story to fully believe it. And the and the I will say this: the reaction I've had is bigger than for any film I've done before. Again, all credit to Carl and Betty. Yeah. So th there's a, a book that that I really like that kind of covers a lot of this, and it's throwaway culture. That some people are throwaways, and Carl I think is a great example of resisting throwaway culture. And you've taken his story and other stories, and you've created for Indiana schools, and I presume any school around the country. The, Ers the Erskine Personal Impact Curriculum. Can you talk about what that is and what you're trying to achieve with that? Absolutely. It's actually patterned a little bit after we did a curriculum with the EVA Core documentary as well, the EVA Education Program. And we were fortunate enough through a, a lovely donor to get that, which includes a shortened version of the film and, and lesson plans and all sorts of neat stuff. We were able to get that into every single middle school and high school in Indiana. That is a lot. And now for the last four or five years, there's been an official EVA Education Day on January 27th every year, as proclaimed by Governor Holcomb here in Indiana. We looked, Special Olympics and I thought that Carl and Betty's story was certainly worthy of the same kind of treatment. And certainly we are not educators, but we put together a team of educators who built this around the themes of Carl's life, inclusion, of diversity, of just, just how to be of acceptance. And again, there is, we shortened the film from 90 minutes to I think 56 and broke it up into three parts. So it's, you can get at it easier that way for kids who might not have the longest attention spans. There are video lesson plans. There are three books. We actually authored three books for this, one for grade school, one for middle school, and one for high school, all using Carl's story, his buddy Johnny's story, Jackie's story, Jimmy's story. And that's been the thread for Carl, from Johnny to Jackie 
to Jimmy, The Parallel. That was Carl's last book he wrote. It was called A Parallel, and it was about that, looking at the similarities, not totally similar by any means, but these incredible social evolutions that have occurred really over the past hundred years in our country. It might seem like a long time, but over the course of history, that is an absolute blip. And Carl pinches himself because he says he was right there and he was fortunate enough to be at the middle of so much of it, but it was more than that. He wasn't just at the middle of so much of it. He did the right thing. In each case, what Carl did, I think it is what is written, what is etched onto the tombstone of his dear friend and former teammate, Jackie Robinson. And what, what is written there is a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. We make a big deal about that at the end of the film because I think that is who Carl is exactly. And he, again, he's, he, and I think, I think people want to, people see in him that he's, I think he's the best kind of hero. There's a million heroes, right? There are heroes in the sports world and in the business world and, and doctors and everybody's a hero these days. I think Carl's heroism is the best kind of heroism because it is an attainable heroism. You don't need to have $5 million. You don't need to be able to dunk a basketball or memorize the Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. We all have it in us what Carl and Betty have done over there together more than 180 years. And I think that's what people relate to. I want people to walk out of there, walk out of the film, thinking, gosh, flabbergasted by what this one guy was able to do. But also thinking, you know what? I think I can do a little more myself. That was the goal with Eva. That was the goal with Addicts. That's absolutely the goal with Carl. And just to get back to Epic, it has been, this is, Special Olympics really took the ball and ran with it. And I just couldn't be more grateful to them, nor impressed by what they did. Again, we have the video component, a shortened version of the film, but we also have lesson plans. We have these three books and we're giving them away for free to every school that asks. We've even taken orders from outside Indiana at this point, but already we had more than, right away, we had more than 300 schools sign up and i think we distributed more than seventy thousand books and then a couple of months ago the major league baseball youth foundation got on board as well and they provided for another fifty thousand books and so to see this kind of become this much more than a film it, it can become a bit of a movement and you, you can't do that with any subject but when you have a when you have a good hand like a carl erskine documentary to do you got to play it for all it's worth. And the notion that 20 years from now, someone, a kid who's not even born today might look across an Indiana classroom and see somebody who doesn't look a thing like him, doesn't act like him, doesn't talk like him, maybe doesn't walk like him. And I, what I read in Epic, I could maybe be that person's. That is a powerful notion. And that's why we wanted to bottle this, sort of bottle Carl's inspiration and spread it really where it matters most, and that would be among children, among the next generation. So we've got listeners across the country and around Indiana. How, if they want to recommend this to their schools, how would they go about that? Okay, there's the website that I would turn them to is O, that's like Special Olympics, soindiana.org slash epic, E-P-I-C. And by the way, that stands for the Erskine Personal Impact Curriculum. So again, that website is soindiana.org slash epic. However, you can also get there just by going to carlerskinfilm.com. There's a direct link. That's where I would advise people really to go because it's kind of one-stop shopping for everything. But you can absolutely get involved. The Eva Core one started out as a statewide thing and then ended up being picked up by PBS National, PBS Learning Media. These are the teachers are looking to teach these kind of things these days and they can do it and we've done this they're all touches the right things that needs to touch it dots all the i's and crosses all the t's of all the all the educational standards and it fits in we and we show how it can be fit into really any almost any subject and it's, it's the reaction that we're getting has just been it's been phenomenal from teachers from principals from students and here's another thing I, what's been interesting is that let's say African Americans, they they there's African American. Unfortunately, not as much now due to some national forces. You know they know what their history was about because they it's taught. But so many people with intellectual disability, like the rest of us, 
didn't know the evolution there at all. And so to see, we had a special screening for Special Olympics athletes. We've now had several. And we asked people after, what made you mad? What made you happy? And people were just outraged, outraged by how people like them used to be treated in this country. And you could, it was just palpable dripping out of them. They're thinking, that could have been me. That could have been me who was locked up at institution. That could have been me who was forced to be sterilized. And that is, was a real moment for me to see, wow, these, they're learning this for the first time, like so many of the rest of us. So it's, I think it's, this story masquerades as a baseball story and the baseball is fun and we have got great footage and cool stories. And if you're a fan of that era or just a fan of sports in general, you're going to get a kick out of that. But what the idea is, that's the first half of the film. And then we go into Jimmy. And then we look at this evolution of the treatment of people with intellectual disability, and then we bring it around with Special Olympics and look how far it's come now. So it's bringing a whole new set of eyes to, to that world. Long wanted to do a piece centered around Special Olympics in some way, but I could never really find my way in. It just struck me that if I did a whole piece on Special Olympics, that that would be my audience. People who competed in it, people whose kids competed in it. It's very broad. But this way, all of a sudden you're getting all these people who come here to see, they think they're going to see a sports film and they see a lot of great stuff, but they walk away with a whole different just perspective and a whole different perspective of this guy, Carl Erskine. Again, 99 out of 100 people on the street, they wouldn't know he, who he is. People who've seen the film, people who've met him in person, they'll never, ever forget him. He's that kind of rare being that when you have somebody out there whether it's me or whether it's somebody else, someone's got to chronicle that for posterity because I think people will be learning from that man and his wife and their son for a long, long time. All right, Ted Green, thank you so much for joining me here on the show. I really appreciate your time. Oh, no, I, again, I appreciate the platform. Again, carlerskinfilm.com. I hope people uh, take it, take some time to check it out. And we'll put all those links in the show notes so you can check all of that out. And thank you, for listener. We really hope that you enjoyed this program. If you got something out of it, the best way to support Ted, the best way to support me or any content creator that you love is to share this, share their work. And uh, we thank you for being here. So thank you again. We'll see you here soon on The Chris Spangle Show.